Now, case number three. In the limit when epsilon is equal to one, when epsilon tends towards one, what I can say and I did not mention is that epsilon cannot equal to one. So technically, this value does not exist. Right? Uh, why is that? Because as you can see, the energy has to be greater than the potential. It cannot be equal to the potential that occurs when epsilon is equal to one. But what I can do is that I can let epsilon tend towards one to really find what is the transmission coefficient at that point. Now, very easy. All you need to do is to just recognize that this will become a small number. So, uh, one minus one is a small number. The sine function becomes that. Okay, and I'll just substitute this inside the transmission coefficient, and I get this value over here. Okay, so this uh, value is just really telling me what what the value of the transmission coefficient when epsilon equals to when epsilon tends towards one. So I decrease the energy value up to this point where it's almost touching the potential. What's the transmission coefficient? The transmission coefficient is given by that over there. Alright, so our analysis is quite fair, but I did not mention the idea of now keeping the ratio constant between the energy and the potential and vary the width of the barrier as given by A. We vary A, we vary lambda. Let's see what we get when we do that. So now, the idea here is we want to hold epsilon fixed and we will vary lambda, right? Now, if we, the approach is about the same, but now the only difference is that for the sine function, lambda is a linear term. It's only like lambda by itself, as opposed to when we vary epsilon, we had the square root of epsilon minus one. So in a way, yes, maybe it's easy to handle. Now, before I proceed, I again want to see what's the maximum and minimum values of the transmission coefficient. Sine is bounded between minus one to one. Sine squared is bounded between zero to one. So it's no, it's no surprise that the maximum value is equal to 1, all right? Uh, when sine is equal to 0, or when sine squared is equal to 0, we get 1. But what is the minimum value? The minimum value is when I get 1 divided by the biggest value I can get as the denominator. So I want to maximize this. Maximize this, I'll let it equal to 1. So I would just get 1 plus 1 divided by 4 epsilon multiplied by epsilon minus 1. Okay, this is the minimum value and raised to the power of minus 1. But I can rewrite that bring the denominator to the top, taking the reciprocal, so 4 epsilon, epsilon minus 1, and I'll divide that by 4 epsilon, epsilon minus 1, plus 1. And if you wish, you could really just put in the values of the, the energy and the potential V0 inside there to express everything in terms of the energy and the potential, maybe, you know, to, to be a more practical use. But again, our approach is the same. We want to find when the transmission coefficient is equal to 1, that would occur when the sine function is equal to 0. So, as always, holding epsilon fixed, we again solve for this humble trigonometry function over here, which is really the, the sine function. And I, and I get this result. But now, the only difference is that lambda, since I'm changing lambda, holding epsilon fixed, lambda would now take discrete values, right? Oh, sorry, lambda will take more clearly. Lambda will take discrete values for the, the full transmission coefficient. Lambda can take any value because we vary the, the, the width of the barrier, we vary lambda. But for these values of lambda, which is lambda n is equal to n pi divided by the square root of epsilon minus 1 for n equals to 1, 2, 3, we will get full transmission. Right? Now, what I want to do is that for practical uses, let's express this in terms of the width of the barrier. So lambda n now becomes a n. But now I would just bring this term over to the other side. I get a h bar, and I'll get a square root of 2m v0. Then I multiply that by 2m. Now my 1 divided by square root of epsilon minus 1, I would just rewrite this in terms of the energy and the potential v0. A square root of v0 will go to the top, okay? Because as you can see, uh, epsilon is e minus v0. I will express all in terms of v0. And what's at the bottom is a e minus v0, okay? Square root of e minus v0. Noticing now that the, the square root of v0 will cancel out. So I would have this lamb, uh, n pi, okay? And then I have a h by the top. And at the bottom, I would have a 2m v, uh, e minus v0, right? And if you were to notice carefully, did we see this term before? Okay, this h bar divided by square root of 2m multiplied by e minus v0. Yes, we did. When solving the potential barrier, this is actually our wave number at the point where the potential is equal to v0. So if I were to re-express that again, I will get uh, a n equals to n pi divided by uh, k2. I believe yeah, it's k2. And now, I want to say this k, this pi divided by k2 has actually a significant meaning. Okay? It is actually half the wavelength of the particle as linked by de Broglie's hypothesis because de Broglie's hypothesis, we, ha we had this idea as lambda, not to be confused with this lambda over here. This lambda is the wavelength of the particles even by, by Planck's constant divided by momentum 
and the wave numbers equals to the momentum divided by h bar. So if we were to use these uh, connections between the particle like behavior and the wave like behavior as predicted that by the Broglie's hypothesis, we will find that this is actually half of the wavelength of the particle. But what is the real significance? The real significance, as we can say, is that if the width of the barrier, remember we are always dealing, well right now we are dealing with the potential barrier, right? The potential barrier. If we adjust the width of the barrier to take a value of an integer multiple of half the wavelength of the particle, we will get full transmission, right? And that's why I've conveniently sketched pi divided by k2 uh, at these points over here because at those points what I can say is that this is equal to 1, right? This is equals to 1 over here, this is equals to 1 over here, and this is equal to 1 over here. And then by sketching out the, the diagram, okay, I would ultimately get something like this. Which go something like that. Yep. Uh, okay. Now, as you want, you can really just uh, use your graphical methods to sketch it out. But now, this is telling me that I'm holding the energy of the particle and the, and the potential is fixed. Unlike the first case, the first case I was adjusting epsilon to get this full transmission. Another route to the problem is that now we are holding energy and the potential fixed and we are adjusting the width of the barrier A. And if the width of the barrier takes integer multiples of half the wavelength of the particle in that region, I will get full transmission. And this is really another way to get t equals to 1. Now there's one last way that I want to mention very quickly, okay, because this is quite unique. Now, let's observe this term over here, okay? This term we have over here. What can I say is that that is between 0 to 1, okay? And then if I were to solve sine, uh, sine uh, lambda epsilon minus 1, the square epsilon equals to 1, I would do the same thing, and then I would ultimately have lambda epsilon minus 1 is equals to, this would be n plus half, yeah, n plus half uh, pi. Right, n plus half pi, but this time n is e starting from 0, 1, 2 because if I let 0 over here, I get half pi. Now, what I want to do there is that this sine, this sine function equals 1, that means 1 over here, I will sketch out the graph, okay, which is given by this over here, which, which I did not sketch out. Okay, this graph would be is uh, 1 plus 1 plus 4 epsilon, epsilon minus 1 uh, of minus 1, okay. As we can see, it will tend towards 1 when epsilon tends towards infinity, but what I can now say is that notice that this graph does not have full transmission of particles. Yes, it may defeat our purpose, but at least it's another insight that we have learned. It does not have full transmission of particles. So if we are down to the case where we don't want full transmission of particles, this is the graph that we want to sketch. But in order to attain this graph, what we can do is that we can adjust values for lambda, values of epsilon, which in turn is adjusting values of the width of the barrier, of the energy of the particle and of the potential and when we adjust these values the transmission will not be equal to 1. So there it is. What our lesson is that how are we get full transmission of particles now really we see the fruits of learning the theory. Engineers, physicists, experimentalists will come to us and they will say that I got a problem professor. The problem is I need to get full transmission of particles. Then we say you want a full transmission of particles? Quantum theory tells us that if you have these cases certain, va certain uh, values of the epsilon, the ratio between the energy of the potential, certain values of the width of the barrier, or even, you know, uh, letting the energy tend towards infinity, you will get full transmission. But you say that, oh, but in the confines of my problem, I cannot let the energy of the particle tend towards infinity. The equipment does not allow me to attain that. It doesn't matter. As long as you can have the ratio fixed in these values, you can get full transmission of particles or you adjust the width of the barrier. So now, that is where the, the beauty of learning this quantum theory is. We can now handle these problems and really attain full transmission of particles based on what are the limitations that we have. So maybe tomorrow, you might want to head over to the engineering department and tell your professor, Professor Danny has taught me how to get full transmission of particles. And here it is.